Hello and welcome to another episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie, brought to you by Killer Podcasts and Evergreen Podcasts Network. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. It's the show that takes you inside the unbelievable, the unexplainable, the macabre, and the bizarre and tries to find an answer. Hi, Caroline. Hi. Are you excited for a return to uh, naval weirdness today? I don't want to take out my belly button right now. You, um, no, I'm talking about oranges. Oh. Strictly Mandarin oranges today. I thought we already talked about pirates and scurvy before. <laughs> we did. Uh, that was in our previous run of... It's been a very nautical uh, spring for us here on Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. We had our series of ghost ship episodes. Mm -hmm. uh, we had just a couple of weeks ago uh, the life and times of Blackbeard. Mm -hmm. As you just referenced, Carrie. And now today, we're talking about um, a little piece of U.S. naval weird history with the Philadelphia Experiment. Ah. Uh, have you heard of the Philadelphia Experiment, Carrie, and what do you know? Is that what Elton John was talking about in that song, Philadelphia Fever? Uh, no, but Tom Hanks did star in a movie about it in the 80s. No, Sean. Uh, all I know is ship was there, ship was not there. Uh, that's right. So very astute, Carrie. And for... it's like a government conspiracy thing, of course. So for those who don't know, the Philadelphia Experiment is the premise that on October 28th, 1943, the U.S. Navy destroyer escort USS Eldridge became completely invisible mm -hmm. as the result of a naval experiment. Um, the ship allegedly also teleported at that time for several minutes to Norfolk, Virginia. So was Apparently, it possibly that it wasn't invisible? It just wasn't there? Well, this was an unintended side effect of the invisibility project. Oh. Um, and we'll get into it, but there may or may not have been tests before this that rendered the ship partially or completely invisible without the teleporting. Um, just vaguely invisible. <laughs> there are reports of sinister side effects, though. Some crew on the ship allegedly being left insane fused with bulkheads and steel sections of deck or other deck equipment, and some left frozen in time. This is like if H.P. Lovecraft became a splatterpunk writer. And it's the USS Eldritch, too. Oh, yeah. Not Eldritch, Eldridge, yeah, but close still. close enough. Um, so, it's a fascinating story, and if you... Type in the Philadelphia Experiment into your old Google machine. You'll soon be looking at a lot of pretty crazy stories of uh, government conspiracy and, yes, UFOs. Yay. But I was curious to see where all of this um, led back to. And um, sometimes, Carrie, it's, it's amazing how much almost an inverted pyramid can end up resting on the head of a pin. Okay, we're talking pyramids, we're talking Illuminati. And the pinhead in this case was was named Carlos Allende. Oh, okay. And we'll get to Mr. Allende in just a second. First, I actually have to introduce you to the man he started corresponding with in 1955. That man was Morris Ketchum Jessup. Uh, Jessup was 55 years old in 1955. He had graduated with a degree in astronomy and then launched right into doctoral work in astrophysics. He had an intense um, fascination with space, but the rigors of academic, higher academic life proved too much for him, and he dropped out uh, before finishing his doctorate and ultimately worked in unrelated fields, mostly auto sales, for the rest of his life. So smart guy, but maybe a little stressed. Uh, maybe a little stressed, but, but he never lost that fascination with space. And so in 1955, he printed his first book, The Case for the UFO, Unidentified Flying Objects. Now, 1955 is not too long after the very first UFO sightings were being reported. Um, it's not too long after the alleged crash in Roswell, New Mexico. It's not that long after Georgia Damsky's um, exploits out in the desert. Careful, careful mentioning Georgia Damsky. Uh, Georgia Damsky, we found recently that Georgia Damsky still has like adherents, like followers, who uh, are none too pleased when they hear our coverage of Mr. Adamski's uh, story. We got a hate email that seems to insinuate you're very religious. Would, so I don't know where they got that from. That couldn't be further from the truth. But also, I 
don't like I really like George Adamski. I think he's a really funny You and, like him, you just don't believe him. Yeah, I think he's a funny and harmless figure and um any of my ribbing isn't isn't meant to be cruel to Mr. Adamski. And he's dead anyway. Fair enough. In 1955, Jessup printed The Case for the UFO, Unidentified Flying Objects, getting in on this wave of UFO excitement that was uh, kicking off around the country. In it, he pointed out dozens of incidents of unidentified flying objects, posited that they were, most likely, extraterrestrial exploratory craft from some alien civilization, and suggested that this was a field worthy of study that could lead to great technological advances. He hoped that alien technology might help to make people or things invisible. Um, so he's, he's got an established interest in invisibility specifically. Produce uh, teleportation effects and, of course, spaceflight. Uh, in the book, Jessup also connects alien visitations with ancient technology, like, say, the pyramids, presaging some of the claims of Eric von Daniken's very famous Chariot of the Gods, 1968. And alien, um, ancient aliens is something that we will have to do on this show in depth at some point, Carrie, including um, a full treatment of Eric von Daniken's several books. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder which one of us should tackle that. <laughs> is that sarcasm? Well, I just feel like we'll, we'll be coming at, from it, uh, we'll be coming at it from different angles. Are you sure? Are you a are you are you a believer in the ancient alien hypothesis? Well, spoiler alert, no. But I don't think I'll make fun of them as much as you would. <laughs> yeah, but I'll do that whether I'm in the driver's seat or not. To quote that email, grow up and get off the air. Uh, we're we've never been on the air, sir. Ma'am, maybe. Well, I didn't ask pronouns. Anyway, shortly <laughs> after the case for the UFO was published. Jessup received a letter from one Carlos Miguel Allende, who claimed to be a veteran of the SS Andrew Furuseth, which was a U.S. Navy cargo ship that had been active during World War II. The letter reads as follows. I am reading ex excerpts because it is um, entirely too long, even if this wasn't basically a cold call to a stranger. My dear Mr. Jessup, your invocation to the public that they move en masse upon their representatives and have thusly enough pressure placed at the right and sufficient number of places wherefrom a law demanding research into Dr. Albert Einstein's unified field theory may be enacted is not at all necessary. It may interest you to know that the good doctor was not so much influenced in his retraction of that work by mathematics as he most assuredly was by humantics. Mm -hmm. I think he means humanism when he says humantics. <laughs> True enough, such a form of levitation has been accomplished as described. It is also a very commonly observed reaction of certain metals to certain fields surrounding a current, this field being used for that purpose. I mean, that kind of describes mag magnetism. Sure. The result, this is skipping down a bit, the result of the experiment was complete invisibility of a ship, destroyer type, in all of its crew while at sea, October 1943, the field was effective in an oblate spheroidal shape extending 100 yards, more or less, due to lunar position and latitude, out from each beam of the ship. Any person within that sphere became vague in form, but... It is vaguely invisible. But he too observed those persons aboard that ship as though they too were of the same state, yet were walking upon nothing. So people, sort of visible, ship, invisible. Any person without that sphere could see nothing, save the clearly defined shape of the ship's hull in the water. How can they specifically make a ship invisible, but not the people on it? Well, How do you specify that? We're made of different kinds of matter than the ship, mm -hmm. so maybe the technology was just affecting their bodies differently. And indeed, he goes on to describe some pretty deleterious side effects of the uh, process. Half of the officers and the crew of that ship are at present mad as hatters. A few are even yet confined to certain areas where they may receive trained scientific aid when they either go blank or go blank and get stuck. Going bland, i.e. an after effect of the man having been within the field too much, is not at all an unpleasant experience to healthily curious sailors. Going bland? 
I think that's a typo. I think he means going blank there, but I'm reading it well, as what's is. What's going blank? Um, going blank, I think, refers to just kind of... It, it, he doesn't describe going, define going blank here, but I'm assuming <laughs> it would be like a, a, t- a catatonic state. Mm-hmm. Getting stuck is getting stuck in time. Mm-hmm. Um, however, it is when also they get stuck that they call it hell incorporated. The man thusly <laughs> stricken cannot move of his own volition unless two or more of those who are within the field go and touch him quickly, else he freezes. A highly complicated piece of equipment had to be constructed in order to unfreeze those who became true froze (laughs) of deep freeze subjects. Usually a deep freeze man goes mad, stark raving, gibbering, running mad, if his freeze is more than a day in our time. I speak of time for deep frozen men, in quotes, are not aware of time as we know it. They are like semi-comatose person who live, breathe, look, and feel but are still unaware of so utterly many things as to constitute another world to them. And I'm turning the uh, screen I'm reading off toward you, Carrie, just so you can see the capitalization. Oh, this looks like a manifesto. Yeah, the capitalization, punctuation, and spelling, you can see all the six I've written in there, um, are not that of a... It may be a Navy veteran, but maybe not a veteran of the Office of Naval Research, Mm -hmm. if you catch my meaning. Mm -hmm. The letter then points Jessup to a small item in a Philadelphia newspaper that uh, Allende claims will confirm the story. Uh, Neither Jessup nor myself nor anyone has been able to confirm that that news item actually existed, but it apparently had to do with some Navy guys smashing a bar up. Okay. He said that it was an after effect of the insanity of the experiment. (laughs) Um, I, I haven't been able to find that newspaper item, though, so that's also suspect. Um, he then lists a few names that I he... I don't know. I'm sure something existed like that. Why would you make that up when it's not even that good evidence? Um, yes, you're right. <laughs> and he did paste a news item to Jessup, but it was such a small clipping that it didn't have the name or date of the newspaper. Mm-hmm. And Jessup was never able to find the same clipping anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, Allende lists a few Navy men who were supposedly witnesses to the thing. Before finishing... I ask you to do this bit of research simply that you may choke on your own tongue when you remember what you have, quote, appealed be made law. Very disrespectfully yours, Carl M. Allen. Wait, I thought he likes him. I also thought his name was Carlos Allende. Well, I just figured he (laughs) shortened it for whatever reason. But like at the beginning, he's like, oh, you're great. Then I think he wrote for so long that his opinion changed. He forgot. And then he's much more respectful in his next note as well. Also, here he leaves a P.S. Will help more if you see where I can. And then in parentheses, Z416175. Mm -hmm. No no explanation. (laughs) Another letter followed a few days later. Notes in addition to and pertaining to missive. And then in parentheses, Contact Rear Admiral Ransom Bennett for verification of info herein. Navy Chief of Research. He may offer you a job, ultimately. (laughs) Thanks. What is this, LinkedIn? (laughs) Um, I wish to mention that somehow, also, the experimental ship disappeared from its Philadelphia dock and only a very few minutes later appeared at its other dock in the Norfolk, Newport, Newportsmouth area. This was distinctly and clearly f- identified as being that place, but the ship them, again, disappeared and went back to its Philadelphia dock in only a very few minutes or less. This was also noted in the newspapers, but I forget what paper I read it in <laughs> or when it happened. That's okay. Yeah, sure. Probably late in the experiments, may have been in 1956, after experiments were discontinued. I cannot say for sure. 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 The records of the U.S. Maritime Service House, Norfolk, Virginia, will reveal who was assigned to S.S. Andrew Furuseth for month of either late September or October of 1943. I remember positively of one other observer who stood beside me when tests were going on. He was from New England, brown, blonde, curly hair, blue eyes, don't remember name. I leave it up to you to decide if further work shall be put into this or not, and write this in hopes there will be. 
So that's weird because it seemed like he didn't want him to continue with his with the, this research and was warning him away from it. But then the well, second, well, it's la- one of those like, don't do it. But if you do, but if you do, I don't know if I can help it. Um, so that's weird. Jessup wrote back to this Allende or Alan. Remember, Jessup was a UFO guy, mm-hmm. and he was interested if this story was more than just a story. So mm-hmm. he wrote back asking for positive proof. To which Carl Allen responded that he would need to have his memory recovered through hypnosis. Of course. In order to provide more information. So since those letters were not totally clear, (laughs) and I was only excerpting them, uh, let me summarize Allen's account. He was serving on the SS Andrew Furuseth when the destroyer escort, the USS Eldridge, was made invisible but with the side effect of the ship inexplicably teleporting to Norfolk, Virginia for several minutes before reappearing back in its Philadelphia dock. Mm -hmm. When it came back, various crewmen were fused with the bulkheads Mm. or pieces of the deck or frozen in time. Many of those men later recovered successfully, uh, at least from their physical ailments, but were now irrevocably insane. Mm -hmm. That's what happens when you become part of the ship. Um, Once Jessup started asking Alan for proof of any of these uh, assertions, Alan stopped responding and sort of disappeared. Hmm. By 1957, Jessup had written three more flying saucer books, UFOs and the Bible, the UFO Annual. He only did one of those in 1958. Well, it's the, it's not an. And the expanding case for the UFO. And he was called into... Oddly enough, the Office of Naval Research. Well, I mean, Carl or Carlos said he would get him a job. He did, but it's not like Jessup. I mean, maybe he, maybe Jessup had reached out at that time and and uh, uh, talked to this uh, rear admirable uh, rear admiral Bennett. Mm-hmm. Um, but somehow, I doubt it. No, the ONR reached out to Jessup because they had actually heard his name before. In late 1955 or early 1956, someone mailed a package, no return address, and only the words Happy Easter scribbled on the outside. It was not Easter. I think it was late 1955. (laughs) Inside the plain package was a copy of Jessup's book, The Case for the UFO, that had been annotated in the margins and in between paragraphs in three different shades of blue ink. Mm-hmm. Uh, writing in apparently three different voices that seemed to be having a conversation with one another. Oh, dear. ONR um, agents started referring to these voices as Mr. A, Mr. B, and Jemmy, J-E-M-I. Uh, two of the voices refer to the third by name. <laughs> so the first two are never named, but the third one's name is Jemmy. Why are they even doing anything with this? Uh, who, the... ONR? Yeah. Well, they have to figure out why someone sent this to them. I'm sure they get bullshit all the time. And the stuff scribbled in the margins was very interesting. The commenters refer to one another as gypsies or fellow gypsies. And Which is a slur. And they seem to be referring to multiple types of people living in outer space. There are references to LMs, um, which I think means little men. <laughs> Okay. But based on another reference I saw, this thing is crazy, by the way. And I encourage our listeners, we'll get into it, but uh, I encourage our listeners to, to take a look at uh, the so-called Vero Manuscript. Uh, because it's uh, you can read it for free right now on the internet, and it's wild. So, they talk about LMs and SMs. And I th- little men and small men? <laughs> I think little men and saurian men, actually. Isn't that one of the things people call reptilians? Oh, I thought it was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> could be could be that too um and lm could also mean lemuria and Moanina. i saw those words together at one point in in this book uh and maybe that's muanina actually of course lemuria and mu are two of the fabled like lost continents that the original races of man came from in um a lot of ufo and frankly nazi lore mm-hmm um, and we can get into at another time how UFO lore ties in with anti-Semitism and white supremacy. Cause, it cause always it, swings back around sometime. It always does. But none of that is stuff is in here. I just think S-Men might, might be a reference to... Are you sure it's not 
ass men. Oh, do you think like it's Billy re- Gunn? They're real ass men. You what? think it's the ass man Billy Gunn? Who's Billy Gunn? He's a re- WWE wrestler. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> the comments between Mr. A, Mr. B, and Jemmy, these supposed gypsies, form a commentary on Jessup's work and assumptions from the perspective of apparently highly knowledgeable alien beings. So, underneath an underlined passage relating to nine gleaming discs the size of C-54s, another color of ink reassures, Not to worry, Jemmy. Those were LM ships, not S-men. They are an improved type and were only on a training flight. Under the words, (laughs) Under the words, only a few have dared to admit these phenomena and to investigate them. They write, Don't worry, those few do not count. He again asks too much of proud, vain humankind. Cheering Jessup's takedown of scared, traditional scientists, the commenters write, Such contempt for those badly frightened or strictly orthodox namby-pamby scientists. The shade of Galileo walks again in the name of better science. Will he arouse and enlighten as before? And then in reply, No, my twin, he walks through clouds. Through there is spelled T-H-R-O-O. My head hurts already. Like, what is happening? After Jessup's supposition that the Russians had probably already claimed a few of these flying saucers, the alien commenters wrote, The possibility of the Ruskies have found an old dead ship is not without the realm of possibility. His admittance (laughs) to other forms of humanoid life is near revelatory to what I surmise. He is being led by his shortwave telepathic nose, so to speak, to see those things. He says we, and that could imply anything from one friendly LM to a fellow scientist or his wife or some member of the U.S. government. If what I now surmise is true, then the LMs are in trouble, or the SMs wish to war upon the LMs and are using this man telepathically to get help. Whether this consideration is of import to him only remains to be seen. If it isn't, then he will be left out on an emotional limb trying to say, see, I am right. They are wrong, and we'll forget what is important here. So I'm reminded of God and Joseph watching um, Jimmy Stewart at the beginning of It's a Wonderful Life. (laughs) Is that supposed to be God and Joseph? Yeah. Oh. I think so. Interesting. One Uh, One of them isn't named, and the other one is named Joseph. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm reminded of like any conspiracy I ever look into and just like the screeds that people write and they seem very certain about what they're writing, but none of it makes any sense. And when you, you'll, I'll tell you why it's called this in a second. When you go and look at this Vero manuscript, remember that all these, all this nonsense that I'm reading you is only the outer screed that's written around what's already a UFO book. So it's already, it makes, you know, nothing in the margins makes sense. And then you go outside of them and it's real cartoon stuff. That's at least a matter of opinion. He's recounting stories and sightings and things like that, isn't he? He's laying out a lot of theories. Mm -hmm. And um, I just don't know how much he had to to base those theories on besides uh, kind of hope and excitement. And I think there's something to be said for those things. These phantom commenters, conclusions on Jessup, can be summed up by the following written in the margin shortly before the end of the book. Upon review, I believe this man may be being illuminated telepathically. Somebody, LM or SM, is making him write about what he sees in his head and has checked upon to verify. That somebody wants to come out of hiding, not to be misunderstood or feared, but wants to coexist in a very peaceful fashion. Now in all caps, or is planning on making the Gaori their allies for war. If this is so, then only the SMs would want war. They are immature, and only they are so immature as to desire war. One planet in the galaxy means nothing to them. All they foster is war as a game to alleviate their boredomish, unplayful, unhappy existence. The non-philosophism of humans and SM equals destruction. Uh, 
<laughs> it almost seems like a kind of um, an, a uniquely written book where the real story is all the notes in the margins. And it's kind of just like a creative writing exercise. I was thinking the same thing, actually. It's a really cool way, if frustrating way, to try to take in a narrative. Because mm -hmm. you can read in these margins and try to try to figure out what's supposed to be going on here. Um, throughout, I should note the commenters use weird punctuation and capitalization, hmm. along with many misspellings. Hmm. The guys at the ONR office showed this book to Jessup, who poured over it f for a few hours, before noting that at least one of the samples of handwriting, Mr. A, was pretty identical to that that he was getting in his letters from Carlos Allende. Mr. A. Well, it didn't. It's not like he signs those annotations, Mr. A. They just assign that name randomly. Oh, well, still. Now, this led into a bona fide ONR investigation, or at least Captain Sidney Sherby and Commander George W. Hoover took an interest and looked into this thing. Because they had nothing else to do, I guess. They took Jessup's letters. Uh, Hoover said later, almost kind of embarrassed and by way of explanation, like that he was the special projects officer at the time, and he had a, he had to investigate lots of stuff like this. <laughs> I'm just worried that there's lots of stuff like this. There was a manufacturing company who was doing contract work for the ONR at the time called Vero Manufacturing, and Hoover was in a meeting with Vero president Austin Stanton, just talking shop about some stuff they had to get done, and he mentioned the annotated paperback. He was like, hey, this is weird. This is what I've been working on. What do you think? <laughs> um, Stanton, much more so than Hoover, was fascinated and somehow got permission for Vero to mimeograph 127 copies of the book with the annotations, adding in uh, Allende's letters into what is now called the Vero Manuscript. That's V-A-R-O, Vero. Mm-hmm. Um, you can find it on the internet right now. It has two of Allende's letters to Jessup at the beginning, and then it launches right into the book with the annotations presented in three different colors. Assuming that they're all related. Assuming... You have to... I mean, they had to have assumed that the letters were related to this book, whatever it was. Yes, I think that is... I mean, it makes sense, but... Especially after Jessup confirmed that the handwriting was so close... The working assumption here was that Carl Allen had, uh, whoever he was, had written these, uh, at least those annotations in the book. He was at least one of three people. And then they went and, like, published it for some reason? Uh, they, I mean, they photocopied it, basically. They, they, they published 127 copies. Why? Because they were interested and they wanted people to see it. But who? What are the, the specific 127 people? Um, that's a great question, and it's such a small number that I almost think this guy just had a lot of friends who were like, wait, what? That's fucked up. Let me see. I don't even know if I have 127 friends. Yeah, you, yes, you do. Friends? Acquaintances. <laughs> People I've ever met. <laughs> the story of the Philadelphia experiment doesn't end there, but unfortunately, it does end shortly after for Jessup. Um, after a series of losses in his personal life, including being fired by his publisher, he took his own life on the side of a Florida road, running his car with an exhaust hose into his back window, on April 20th, 1959, just mm. four years after that first letter from Allende had arrived. His letters to Allen had never turned up any further proof that the Philadelphia story was anything but a story, and future book authors would find themselves totally unable to track him down. Re Allende. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Reportedly, the ad address on Jessup's letters would lead them only to, quote, a vacant farmhouse in rural Pennsylvania. Okay. That is until summer of 1969, when Carl Allen walked into the Aerial Phenomenon Research Association and admitted in the next edition of their bulletin that he had hoaxed all of the annotations himself just to scare the hell out of Jessup. Uh, what? Yeah, Alan said he had stayed quiet for years, 15 years at this point, hoping the story would just die down, but recent republications and it kind of kicking up again in, in newspapers around that time had made him want to set the record straight. Why did he do that? 
he didn't seem like, uh, Jessup didn't seem like a bad guy or anything, and he ended up killing himself. Right, but Jessup's book was calling for further investigation into these phenomena that he believed Uf- UFOs were at the center of. Okay. Carl Allen said that he believed that such research would be dangerous, and so to keep this guy from you know, getting too much success and making too much progress in that direction of scientific research... He drove him to his death. Yeah, I don't think that was his intention. What's dangerous about it? Well, well, Carrie, these men were left insane and fused to the... the, uh... But he made that up. Yeah, but he was afraid stuff like that could happen. Yeah, I I could just make up that dinosaurs take over the the world now. It's just me making it up. (laughs) He's afraid of his own thoughts? Well, it's basically the last time Alan would speak publicly on this. Yeah, probably for the best. He has been hard for people to find, and that has left the Philadelphia Experiment story to um, sort of bloat out of control and far beyond its original scope. In fact, the story actually wouldn't peak in popularity until the late 70s and early 80s, which is a long time after these initial reports. And we'll tell you all about how that happened right after the break. Hmm. Ohio is a land of mystery, from missing shipwrecks and lost treasure beneath her surface to strange phenomenon slicing through her skies, from myths that have evolved around historic events and people to the unsolved murders and disappearances that keep her communities wondering what happened. Find Ohio Mysteries on your favorite podcast app, and let's explore the inexplicable. OhioMysteries.com Welcome back. When last we left you, I think I had just confused the hell out of my wife. (laughs) Yeah. With the screeds... The screeds of Carl Allen and the uh, history of the Philadelphia experiment. And just his batshit motivate. Like, I'm still confused. Which, so which parts confuse you? Which parts? All, all parts. Why did he do this? What was he afraid of? Why did he target Jessup of all people who didn't have the most popular books? Well, because at- that's why he killed himself, right? Like, well, at the time. <laughs> How did he come up with this bullshit? Why was he afraid of it even happening? I just... At the time, and as far as I can tell, Alan's... I don't know, by the way, why he signed some letters Allende. Was his name really Allende? His name was Carl M. Allen. (laughs) Okay. Um, And for the time being, I believe that when he came out with that, like, confession in that UFO magazine... I think that's the first time Carl Allen had really spoken publicly. I mean, the public sort of knew his name, but only because of that. So is it possible that this is just some random guy taking credit for it to Uh, be part of the story? Well, eventually someone would track down Carl Allen and um, find out what was going on there, but it wouldn't be until the year 1980. I hope it was a therapist. It wasn't. (sighs) And it wasn't yet either. So... What we had here was a story with a dubious source. That source wasn't speaking anymore, and it was left to morph over the years as people tried to figure out what Carl Allen could have been talking about. The conspiracy theory that grew was as follows. Uh, Albert Einstein, Carrie. As you know, he was working for much of his career on a unified field theory. Now, for Einstein, what that meant was making his general theory of relativity work with modern understandings of electromagnetic fields. There were just some parts of the math that didn't work, and he spent a lot of time trying to figure it out. Um, Ultimately, didn't come up with a unified field theory before he died. Mm -hmm. All Philadelphia experiment stories are built on the misunderstanding that Einstein had made. I guess, first of all, the misunderstanding about what a unified field theory is. It would just be, he was just looking for a set of equations that would kind of 
elegantly describe reality, basically. Sure, easy. Easy, you know. Uh, and I'm not going to get into general relativity here because... Oh, it's probably for the best after all this. Because we just don't have time. And I've already exploded your brain with nonsense, so I can't put r- real facts into it now. <laughs> but Carl Allen's understanding was that Einstein was working towards a thing that was called u- a unified field theory that had to do with some as-yet unknown properties of fields, right? And, and that this would unlock some kind of uh, power. It's almost as if like scientific mathematical formulas are like spells or something. And that once a scientist finds <laughs> that perfect formula, it's like, yes, the secret to levitation. No, it's just really something to explain something that already is there. Right. And so all of these stories are built on the misunderstanding that Einstein had made additional discoveries about the relationships between these fields, and Allen says that Einstein considered his own discoveries dangerous, and so then just lied about not having been able to unify the theory. And this is just Allen's random make-believe in his head. Right. Now, meanwhile, Einstein did work with the U.S. government, as you know, Mm -hmm. and so the government took his unified field theory that he didn't want to push any further and started working on the USS Eldridge, which was fitted with experimental equipment at its Philadelphia shipyard. Testing would have become begun sometime in the summer of 1943, and most accounts have it that there was some success in these tests. Scientists were able to reduce the appearance of the ship and the crew to a greenish mist, or maybe make them disappear altogether, but never without dire side effects to at least a few of the crew members. Again, It's always the same stuff. Guys being turned inside out, guys being fused with solid objects, um, guys who go intangible and never come back, uh, and guys who are frozen in time. And of course, you always have guys who go totally crazy. Now, where are the sources for this besides Carl Allen? None. Okay. (laughs) Additional calibrations uh, and recalibrations were made. And possibly ignoring warning signs, the researchers tried it again. And this time, the Eldridge disappeared in a flash of blue light and appeared in Norfolk, Virginia, 200 miles away, where it sat for a few minutes in view of the Andrew Furuseth, which was then docked in Norfolk. And it came back. Mm -hmm. And still, we have no sources for this whatsoever, aside from the original letters. Yeah. That's correct. Well, certainly in the as of nineteen in the nineteen seventies, we didn't. And we're certain this guy wrote those letters. Yes, he well he admitted that he had written the. Well, people admit to things all the time. Yeah, but the, his handwriting also was the same. I admitted to killing Abraham Lincoln. No, I know, but this guy's handwriting <laughs> as was, a child. His handwriting was also the same. But oh, don't worry, we're going to come back to Carl <sighs> Allen. But we have to leave him for the time being because. It's the mid-70s, and any reporter or book author who wants to talk about the Philadelphia experiment, and there are a lot of them, can't get a hold of Carl Allen. He doesn't seem to be dead, but he just can't be tracked down, and that makes him more mysterious and kind of helps the legend to grow. Was Carl Allen an alien? Uh, they, maybe they were just not looking under the name Carlos Allende. Or maybe they were, and that was the problem. <laughs> In 1979... Charles Berlitz and William L. Moore. Uh, Berlitz had previously become a bestseller with a book on the Bermuda Triangle, and William Moore is was and is a ufologist, uh, released The Philadelphia Experiment, Project Invisibility. We'll workshop it. Um, <laughs> it's uh, probably the second, if unless you count the Vero manuscript, this is probably the best-known book on this phenomenon. It purports to be a factual account of the alleged government experiment, but it only has the Vero manuscript to fall back on as a source. The Philadelphia Experiment, Project Invisibility, also invented a speculative narrative about a government cover-up. Like, well, if they did this, then this is how it had to be covered up, so then they write for chapters about that. Mm -hmm. And then um, they also expand on what these supposed discarded theories of Einstein's might have looked like. Okay. And that's uh, about the makeup of that book. But it did kind of reignite public interest in this story. So much so that in 1984, 
director Stuart Raphill was able to make The Philadelphia Experiment a major motion picture. Oh, I didn't know there was a movie. Yeah. In, in this movie, um, they sort of expand the story a little bit. U.S. Navy sailors David Herdig and Jim Parker are launched into the far future of 1984 when they leap <laughs> off of the... <laughs> the far future. When they leap off of the Eldridge as the uh, ill-fated experiment is going down. Once in the future, they have to figure out what happened to them and find a way home and a way to stop the experiment from destroying space-time itself. Well, that's fun. It sounds like a fun, you know, plot for a movie. Um, yeah, there's even a little bit of a time after time element to it. I was thinking of that. Jim like meets a girl in 1984 who thinks he's crazy, but likes it, takes a liking to him and helps him accomplish his, his mission. Mm-hmm. Little fish out of water comedy. Any the... big actors in it? No. Okay. <laughs> but here, here's the trailer. It was October 1943. The United States government authorized an experiment that would render its ships undetectable by radar. The experiment took place on a ship in Philadelphia Harbor. Generators activated, sir. For 41 years, the government denied it ever happened. I don't believe this. The Eldridge has vanished. Of course she has. She's radar invisible. No, sir. She's really vanished. But one ship did disappear, and two of the crew suddenly find themselves in the present. Maybe all this isn't real. You tell me this is my imagination? You think the Navy knows what they're doing? You saw the guys on the boat? This wasn't supposed to happen, Jimmy. Dun, 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 dun. That's the end? The Philadelphia... Exp- oh, no, that's like a three-minute trailer. They, oh, they, okay. sh- they, they show the title four times. <laughs> Don't forget. Yeah, uh, trailers in the 80s were a hell of a thing. The Screaming Skull. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was kind of the height of Philadelphia experiment. Um, fever? Fever, if you will, yes. Um, but I did promise we would return to uh, Carl Allen. And I've actually done you a disservice here, Carrie, because the coda to his story comes before that movie came out. In 1980, a journalist named Robert Gorman was writing for Fate magazine. In Gorman's article, he says he had had Alan's last known address for years. He had gotten it through, uh, through a friend of a friend, and it was actually in the town that Gorman lived in, Kensington, New Kensington, Pennsylvania. And he just like waited years and years to follow up. Well, it sounds like me doing anything. The story had faded out of the papers. He had initially gotten this after Alan's initial confession. Um, but there were rumors flying around that Alan had retracted his confession. And so he thought he would go and fi- uh, track, this, uh, track this family down finally. Mm-hmm. Gorman did. Now, it turned out... Carl Allen's father was a guy Robert Gorman already knew. His daughter would like to go over and visit this kindly old man down the street. It was Carl Allen's dad. <laughs> okay. His last name was Allen, but, uh, you know, he didn't connect him with Allen slash Allende till, till now. Um, here, Gorman learned from Allen's family that his full name was Carl Meredith Allen. Not. Carlos Miguel Allende. <laughs> no, not at all. Miguel doesn't come into it in any place. Well, it's better than Meredith, I guess. His parents described Carl as a fantastic mind, but a master leg puller. And I would say that he had some pretty clear and untreated mental illness as well, because his parents gave Robert Gorman armloads of books, magazines, uh, photographs, even greeting cards and letters that... Alan had received all had been annotated in exactly the same way with like these fake characters no, talking not in the voices of aliens okay but sometimes in multiple voices or characters and always about like esoteric subjects and in the same patterns even that uh Alan had in the previous book okay and as one last little interesting tidbit The numbers and letters that Alan had ended his very first letter with, Z416175, Gorman found that on his military service record. It was his service number. Did he actually work on that boat that he said he worked on? Uh, That we're not sure about, but he was in the Navy. 
Um, he probably was assigned to the Furaseth. Yeah, I mean, I don't see why not, but... Right. They don't have records for that sort of thing? Um, I haven't been able to find records of every crew member who was on it. They do have records of where those ships were at these times, and um, I'll get into that in a little bit. We have one last Philadelphia experiment uh, witness yet to come out of the woodwork. Okay. Because while 1984 was the height of Philadelphia experiment fever, it wasn't the end of it. The last man to come out in connection with this story was Alfred Bialik. Okay. (sighs) Oh boy, what? Bialik didn't come out with his story until 1989. Why are these all, like, all of these events happening on, like, 59, 69, 79? Well, that's very interesting, right? Mm -hmm. But all I can say about this is it's five years after the Philadelphia Experiment movie Mm. in 1984. Okay. So, Bielek started claiming that he had been aboard the Eldridge during the experiment. He was invited to the 1990 Mutual UFO Network Conference where he said it pretty much happened exactly like that movie from 1984 it happened. Oh. I read the uh, text of his speech. He literally shows like the first 10 minutes of the movie and goes, yeah, the only thing that changed was the date. So he, he went back er, forward in time and fell in love with a, a lovely lady. and He did go forward in time. <laughs> oh, okay. Bielek also claims in his speech that the uh, U.S. government actually successfully got that movie banned for two years. Couldn't see it at all for two years after it came out because um, the government shut it down. Mm-hmm. Not true. But, you know, I'm sure not a lot of people have seen it. So there's right. that. <laughs> yeah. In the speech, Bielek told about him and his and his brother's work with John von Neumann and Albert Einstein and Nikola Tesla on the Philadelphia Experiment. Was Tesla around at this time? Uh, Funnily enough, Nikola Tesla died in January of 1943. Oh. I didn't even realize he was alive that late. Yeah, but Bielek refers to conversations that he personally had with Tesla in, like, March of 1943. Okay. He also says the experiment, like I said, he said the only thing that changed was the date. He said the experiment was actually August 12th of 1943 and not October 28th, as Carl Allen had originally claimed. Mm-hmm. After his time with the, with the secretive Project Phoenix was over, Bielik says that he was brainwashed by the U.S. government and then maybe forcibly, tri- forcibly time-traveled. Oh. This is a quote from the speech. And I know you've loved all the quotations of this episode so far, Carrie. (laughs) They decided they didn't want me around anymore for whatever reasons. And they did a number on me. Total brainwashing. Established a new personality. Shipped me back into the past. And I became Alfred Bialik. With a new set of parents and a false birth certificate and a complete cover-up story, which hung together, and memories which may or may not be quite true, but nevertheless still there. Well indoctrinated. I had not the foggiest notion that I had ever been involved in the Philadelphia experiment, much less the Phoenix Project, until sometime in 86 in the Phoenix Project. The reason why I became aware of it was that I revisited Long Island and long since left it. Went out on the site at Montauk with some friends. Eventually, some of the memories started to come back. They said, you were part of it. I said, no, I'm not. Eventually, I remembered I was. Is he confusing the Philadelphia experiment with the Montauk Project? Uh, He says the Montauk Project was part of it, and in fact... Part of it. In 83, he says that on August 12th of 1983, the same phenomenon occurred, like in sympathetic... Like, he basically that that ship time-traveled to 1983 and hung out in Montauk for a little bit as well. Oh. Was there any report of that? No, of course not. Okay. (laughs) But in January of 88, I remember the beginnings of memory of the Philadelphia experiment, and it has kept growing in terms of memory ever since then. My brother does, my brother does remember it also. And it's been a horrendous waste, I would say, of a career and knowledge I once had. Pieces of it come back at times, but the basic personality remains quite stably as Al Bielek, and the memories of Edward A. Cameron flit in and out. But they're mostly there now, particularly the earlier years, up to and through the experiment. From 43 to 47, a good part of it is blank. I don't know what else happened. 
except I know that in 47, they decided I was no longer useful. In fact, I had to be gotten rid of. So that basically is the story of what happened. So his original persona was Cameron, and then he was sent into the past with new parents? Yes, Edward Cameron. In future lectures and interviews, including with our friends Coast to Coast AM and Art (laughs) Bell, um, Bielek would expand on his story. At some point in the 40s or late 30s, he and his brother were pulled through time travel to 1983 to speak with mathematician John Van Neumann, uh, one of the mathematicians who worked on the Manhattan Project. He was not alive in 1983, of course, um, but had time traveled there as 1983 was the headquarters for Project Phoenix, a top secret government project on time travel. Now, (laughs) this timeline is as fuzzy and messed up as like a Marvel movie. Well, it's, it's really hard to get this timeline right for Alfred because he's only be able to retrieve these memories through hypnotic regression because right. after about 1947 the government sent him back in time to uh, I think be a child again <laughs> with a new set of parents and a new name. I don't think that's how that works. But he said they sent him through time. Yeah, so he wouldn't he just show up at that point but still be the same age and the same person? Yeah, you would think so. <sighs> but he says they gave him new parents. Okay. Anyway, we, on, on the day of the experiment, which was August 12th in his estimation, not October 28th, Alfred leaped from the ship, just like the sailors in the movie, The Philadelphia Experiment, and time traveled to the future, just like the sailors in the movie, The Philadelphia Experiment. Except Alfred eventually would decide that he had time traveled to the year 2137, where the advanced people there gave him radiation treatment and told him about the fall of the United States after the 2005 U.S. versus Russia and China war that killed billions of humans. He would... Very John Teeter. Mm-hmm. It's incredibly John Teeter. And I asked you about John Teeter earlier today, <laughs> and this was why. Um, before returning home to be with his brother again, Alfred visited the floating cities of 2749, Ooh. which he said was totally controlled by an AI that had replaced world governments and ended wars. So the Matrix... Yes, except that it was a good guy. Well. Um, so, so yes, the timeline is fuzzy, but that's because I think it's fuzzy for Alfred because the poor guy has lived two different lives of full of memories. Or says he has, yeah. And um, has time traveled a bunch. He doesn't know where he is or when. I wouldn't either. Um, this stuff all makes sense to you, right, Carrie? What? Scientifically? No. Okay, well, I... W- <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Bielek made several appearances on Coast to Coast AM uh, to talk to, with Art Bell in 1994. And, um, well, let's take a listen, because I, I think he explains this pretty concisely here. Enter this thing at some point along the edge of what we call our reality and create an artificial field which would affect within that field only the flow rate of time by affecting T2, you affect T1, and you can then affect the position where that object, in this case a ship, was on the edge of the coil of time, as we call it. I'm speaking mathematically, of course. All right, I think I've almost got this. Um, okay. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> Art, uh, I think I've almost got this. Now, what they were doing was by very complex fields affecting the time flow rate, and if you start to move the object around the edge, it starts to go out of our reality into the next one. You have to also understand that there are multiple realities involved in our universe, and they're all interrelated, but they're interrelated by being phased out uh, of our reference, phased out in time by at least 90 degrees into another reality. All right. Uh, Al, would that be, again, staying with the analogy of the slinky, then? (laughs) Wait, what? (laughs) I love art is trying to bring it back to the simplest possible terms. I mean, you got to. Uh, in, okay, yeah, uh, yeah, time dilation, uh, rotate 90 degrees into another reality. Got it. Uh, now, back to the slinky. <laughs> Would that be instead of traveling along the surface of the slinky and going around and around and around and around, it is though you're, uh, as though you're jumping from one, one, one link to the other link directly without traveling the entire path. Is that? That's, that is correct. All right. 
Well, that's just the like folding a paper analogy of a tesseract, right? Yeah, except the folding of paper is a lot easier to understand than the slinky one. Uh, yes. <laughs> also, yes. Uh, my brain hurts, Sean. What is happening here? Well, I think we're learning. A, well, okay. So, so this didn't that didn't help make the technology make any more sense for no. you? No. Oh, Caroline. Well. <laughs> Don't you take that tone with me. Well, I've got good news for you, because after a while of Bielek confusing you on the radio, Art mercifully brings in callers to, uh, you know, get... Sometimes you need questions from from the people, you know, so that we can get to what the people really want to know about. So, so let's listen to Art Bell's uh, listeners and their... Incisive questions on this um, Philadelphia experiment. Jeez. Oh, yes, uh, as he traveled through, through time and he had connections with certain government officials, can he verify the Roswell, New Mexico incident and whether alien beings? All right, thank you. Uh... <laughs> it's always this. Yeah, we're like, you know, you went through time. Did he ever see Marilyn Monroe's titties? <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you can ask any question about the past. Hey, he went through time. He, he, he met all kinds of government officials. Cereal soup. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. Uh, do you know anything about other things like uh, Roswell, Al? Yes, I was not part of that directly, but I have read a considerable amount of material. There is ongoing research today. Oh. Okay, we've all read Thanks, a Al. lot. <laughs> oh, God. Mm. All right, Carrie. So there you have it. I have what, Sean? Well, Alfred Bielek says that he was a crewman on on the very ship where this experiment happens. He even, I think, adds a little extra... I think he's trying to add a little extra credibility to himself when he says, Oh, I was there. This happened. But it didn't happen on October 28th. He, right. like, invents a new detail. Of course. And this guy in real life wasn't anywhere near old enough to have actually been there. That's why he made up the thing about being put back in time as a baby. and Probably. So so either he believes this... I mean, I don't know how old he is because we don't even know that this is his real name. He's just a caller on it. Well, I assume that he was sent back in time as a baby because he wasn't old enough IRL to be on the ship at this time as himself so he had to be cameron that was sent back as a baby turned into bielik i'm not totally sure that cameron and bielik are different ages though well at certain points they were because one was a baby right but i mean i I think he might have been sent back to like his birth year (sighs) my head hurts he was sent back to his birth year to leave live his whole life again so he has two memories of his life are you sure he was sent back to his birth year no because he doesn't explicitly say that at all. <laughs> I don't think he explicitly says anything. No, all the stuff melts your brain when you when you read it. It's just, it's a lot. Okay. Um, Carrie, I mentioned that there are records of the positions of the USS Eldridge and the Furuseth at basically all times during World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, the Eldridge actually wasn't commissioned until August of 1943. Okay. It didn't leave the New York Harbor until September, and it was never assigned or docked in Philadelphia at all. Yeah, but they could just be fudging that all. This is according to crewmen who were there at a 1999 reunion of the Eldridge's crew. And was any of them actively the poop deck or something, like meshed with the, the mast of the ship at the time? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. He was speaking through a, uh, a door that was... Uh, no, he's just a, like a foghorn. <laughs> <laughs> Every time he opens his mouth. Yeah, he, you know, we got him. We got Jim pretty much back to normal, except for that horn thing. Weirdly, he's not one of the crazy ones. <laughs> um, also, the... So the Naval History and Heritage Command, which is a, uh, I think, a government-connected agency, Mm -hmm. uh, they say that they looked up the microfilm records uh, to find that the Eldridge was specifically in New York State on October 28th. On November 2nd, it would head down to Norfolk, Virginia, actually, to load up for a convoy to Casablanca, Morocco. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile... They say the Furuseth, the Andrew Furuseth, the one Carl Allen was supposedly on, 
left Norfolk on October 25th and was somewhere on its way to Oran in Algeria on the 28th. Okay. So if those records are correct, um, then the Eldridge was in port, I think, in New York, and the Andrew Furuseth was somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean on October 28th. Now, could these be fixed records? Of course, and that's what people say that they are. Yeah. Uh, Some have pointed out as well that the U.S. Navy was experimenting with degaussing in 1943. And this is where they would actually take like giant coils of wire on a ship, basically, and just blast the deck, blast the whole ship, really, uh, with massive electromagnetic fields that would render them invisible, not to radar, but to magnetic underwater mines and torpedoes. Mm -hmm. So like U-boats would fire torpedoes that were magnetically guided. Mm -hmm. And if your ship had a big honk and magnetic field, it would repel those instead of uh, attracting them. I don't doubt that they might have even seen if they could make ships actually invisible. I don't doubt that they've given everything a shot. Oh, I'm sure they were trying to, yeah. You know, and I'm talking about like legit Wonder Woman's plane actual invisible. And I'm I'm positive that they were trying to make things radar invisible. Uh, and still are. I'm sure there's stuff that they can do now. I don't really know a lot about plane or ship technology um i i haven't been able to find official government confirmation that there was radar um invisibility experiments going on back then oh they've definitely done that but uh in 1994 i can tell you that uh, an electrician named edward dudgeon came forward to tell researchers that he had worked on the eldridge and that it was a ship equipped with these classified degaussing machines Mm -hmm. i believe that um, they've tried everything. MK Ultra is real. They've tried mind control and Manchurian candidate situations, and and they've studied ESP and all different things. I don't I don't know as much about the Montauk Project as I should. I know they were doing some stuff out there. Well, yeah, a, a ship appeared there for a few minutes. <laughs> wow, well, in aside 1983. From that, um, the, the government has done a lot of weird shit. But this just see like it seems like there's literally no basis whatsoever. I thought I thought there was more to this, to be honest. Carrie, um, because it's such a famous conspiracy uh, conspiracy theory. I agree, and and all of the books that people will cite as sources for this story use as their main source the Vero manuscript and Carl Allen's letters and notes. <sighs> There just isn't anything else. And that is the thing that's the most mind-blowing to me about it, actually. Especially since he said in 1969 that it was a hoax. And not even that. I mean, clearly he either enjoyed some kind of weird creative writing or he was mentally ill in some way or some combination of them. Um, There's no there there. There's nothing else to legitimize this except for this guy who's taking things a lot further, uh, Bialik. <laughs> and he's just a, Don, a John Teeter type, right? He just likes the attention? He he's kind of reminds me of that guy, Andrew Basiago, that said he went to Mars with Barack Obama as oh, kids. Oh, yep. Um, which will definitely cover him at some point. His story is similar. And then his... Um, it also reminds me, in the tone, it reminds me of when he talks about this technology and stuff, when we just heard that Coast to Coast clip. Mm-hmm. He, Bielek, that is, reminds me of Joshua P. Warren. Oh, God. By which I mean, this is a guy, like, I think Carl, Carl Allen was a mentally ill man. Mm-hmm. I think Alfred Bielek knew he was full of shit. He's a huckster. And now I don't, he's not selling a product of any kind. But well, I, he's selling himself in a way. And he likes... I think probably the attention. I I couldn't tell you what his motivations are. He didn't get rich off it. He didn't get famous off it. Carl Allen didn't get rich off it. Carl Allen didn't get famous off it. He died in obscurity in 1994. Um, and we'll now never be able to ask him what was really going on that day in Philadelphia. Or Norfolk. I think he was in Norfolk. And well, one of the days. One was August. One was October. Whichever one... It was. And also on either of those days, I think. In either of those places, or in a different time. If Carl Allen was on the, the Andrew Furuseth, 
he was nowhere near the USS Eldridge <laughs> and was likely somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. So that's the Philadelphia experiment, Carrie. I'm sorry to let you down on this one. I really thought there was more to this. Uh, can I encourage you and all of our readers, though? Um, go and... Listeners. Oh, I'm going to make you readers now <laughs> because you're going to look up the Vero manuscript. And uh, I don't... <sighs> I don't know if I have the capacity for that. Uh, just get at us on, uh, you know, on Instagram or uh, hit us up at the old Discord. Let me know, readers, how many um, pages you managed to get through of that Vero manuscript, because it's it's tough. <laughs> like, surprised it wasn't written in diarrhea. Tough. Ugh, Sean. Let's take a trip to the Bazaar Bazaar. According to an Italian scientist, the famed Shroud of Turin is much older than many have stated, and in fact is old enough to date back to around the time of Jesus Christ's crucifixion. You don't say. I do say. Well, the scientist says. And supposed crucifixion. Go ahead. <laughs> For those, oh geez, let's not get into that. For those not in the Catholic know, the Shroud of Turin is a length of linen cloth bearing the negative image of a man, which some believe was the cloth Jesus was wrapped in after death. As the National Catholic Register reports, scientist Liberato De Caro of Italy's Institute of Crystallography of the National Research Council. Oh my God, it's a lot of words. Don't worry. <sighs> It's a, it's a beautiful Italian buffet of words. It's an Italian institution. Uh, he used a wide-angle X-ray scattering method to examine the natural aging of cellulose that constitutes a sample of the famous shroud. DeCaro, along with his team of researchers, concluded that the shroud is, quote, compatible with the hypothesis that it is much older than seven centuries old, the conclusion reached in 1988 using carbon dating techniques, and is actually around 2,000 years old. The National Catholic Register interviewed DeCaro, whose findings were recently published in the peer-reviewed academic journal Heritage, about his conclusion. DeCarroll told the Register, quote, For about 30 years, I have been using investigative techniques on the scale of atoms, in particular through x-rays, and three years ago we developed a new method for dating samples taken from linen fabrics. Of the original carbon-dated findings from 1988, DeCaro stated, quote, According to the results of the radio dating, the shroud wouldn't be an authentic relic since it is from the medieval period. However, fa fabric samples are usually subject to all kinds of contamination which cannot always be controlled and completely removed from the dated specimen. About half the volume of a natural fiber yarn is empty space, the interstitial space, filled with air or something else between the fibers that compose it. Anything that gets in between the fibers must be carefully removed. If the cleaning procedure of the sample is not thoroughly performed, carbon-14 dating is not reliable. This may have been the case in 1988. So, that's pretty cool, and it seems pretty scientific so far. Um, and if our listeners are interested, you can check out more history on the Shroud of Turin, as well as other holy relics, including such oddities as the Holy Foreskin of Jesus, <laughs> the Buddha's Tooth, and even the Virgin Mary's Girdle, um, on our Patreon and we have a mini-sode on there on the subject at Tier 2 and above. Fascinating. Um, I, I, I hadn't heard about this, Carrie. As, as, um, it was just published. I just looked up, apparently there were uh, tests in 2013 that dated the same shroud to between 300 and 400, uh, up 300 BC to 400 AD. Mm-hmm. And those guys seem to say the same thing. Earlier results may have been skewed from contaminations. Yeah. So. So that's uh, really interesting. Might be the real deal. Um, but why would we believe that it is? Because it might be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's it for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. 
Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary, and check out our website at ain'titscary.com. You can support the show by supporting our sponsors and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash ain't it scary. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and also now on Spotify. We'll be forever grateful. Yep, and special thanks to our beloved top-tier patrons already joining us over there for all that good, good content. Nate Curtis, Sean O'Donnell, Jared Chamberlain, Maria Ferrante, Robin McCabe, Comfy Mike, Alex Nakutis, Ryan Regan, and Christy Atchison. We love you guys. See you next Thursday. Show created by Sean and Carrie McCabe, music by Kyle Ryan, and you can find Kyle at his YouTube channel, Music is a Verb. Ain't It Scary has been brought to you by Killer Podcasts and is a production of Longboy Media. Ohio is a land of mystery. From missing shipwrecks and lost treasure beneath her surface to strange phenomena slicing through her skies. From myths that have evolved around historic events and people to the unsolved murders and disappearances that keep her communities wondering what happened. Find Ohio Mysteries on your favorite podcast app and let's explore the inexplicable. OhioMysteries.com.